Dennis Decker grew up in Jackson, Wyoming with a love of travel and adventure. When he was 30 years old, he and his wife, Laura, opened their first RV dealership in the, in the Cody, Wyoming area. It quickly became one of the most successful dealerships in Wyoming. Dennis and his family moved to Utah in 2006, where he became the executive vice president of a tech company in Utah County, directing the successful integration of the company's technology into all major worldwide computer manufacturers' platforms. At this time, Dennis was invited by the governor's office of economic opportunity to travel with the, with the then governor, Herbert, Herbert to London, to promote business opportunities for the state of Utah. After fulfilling his contract in the technology world in 2016, Dennis wanted to travel and decide, decided to surprise his wife with a new Airstream travel trailer. To his astonishment, there was not an Airstream dealership in Utah. Dennis reached out to the Airstream offices and applied for a license to become Utah's only authorized Airstream dealer. Being granted the franchise rights by Airstream, Airstream of Utah opened in February 2017. Airstream of Utah has consistently been a top 10 Airstream dealer in the Western U.S. and has won the coveted Airstream status of being a five rivet dealer. Airstream of Utah has won awards as the best RV dealership in Salt Lake City and best of state in the RV dealership category in Utah. In 2021, Airstream granted franchise rights to the Deckers for the state of Wyoming. Adding to the business opportunity, Dennis made the strategic decision to locate this dealership close to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and included and include a low-density luxury RV resort on the property with a future restaurant to capitalize on the tourist economy of the greater Yellowstone region. Dennis has been recognized for this business plan by Airstream Corporate RV Business Magazine and has been biographed in Who's Who in America. And with that, I will give it Turn the time over to Dennis. Can we all please give him a warm welcome? Thank you, Isabella. Appreciate it. Can you hear me better now? Fantastic. Um, I was telling Isabella a little bit ago that. Uh, Everybody said, but I'm kind of soft spoken, especially my wife. She tells me she can never hear anything I say. I don't know if it's because I'm soft spoken or because we've been married 35 years. But there's a reason I don't think that she can hear a whole lot that I say sometimes. But uh, I appreciate Mountain America inviting me to come and Weaver State inviting me to come. Roger, thank you. Isabella, thank you. Jade, thank you. Uh, Mountain America has been a fantastic partner. Uh, there's been incredible growth that, that our company is has uh, seen in the last few years, and, and I'll talk about that here shortly, but uh, I just wanted to tip my hat to an incredible partner, and in Mountain America has been that. Um, a little bit about myself, as Isabel mentioned, I grew up in, in, in Jackson, Wyoming. I'm a, I'm a Wyoming boy. There's probably 12 of us that are uh, natives to that state, and I'm one of the 12, so uh, you guys are looking at a, at a rare person here. And, and on a side note, actually, my family, we moved over in, into the Cody, into the Bighorn Basin area when I was really young. And, and I was, was actually born over there. And, and uh, I kind of show you that, you know, it's, it's not about where you come from, but it's about where you want to be. I was born deaf. I was born in 1964. And in 1964, there was a bad case of German measles going around the United States. And, uh, there are more deaf children born in that year than any other year. And I and I hit the lottery. I was one of those. Um, I was very fortunate uh, in this little town in Wyoming uh, that after several years, I um, was in several operations. I was able to, to regain my hearing. You know, I was able to gain my hearing. So what a miracle that was. And in the same little town, as I went to first and second grade, there was an incredible speech therapist, and she's and she taught me how to speak. So how cool was that? And uh, so um, you know, we we all have a we all have opportunities in life. We all have uh, hurdles and obstacles, but uh, but you know, be grateful for for those obstacles because they will help you grow and, and help you become who who you are and who you will be. Um, but as mentioned, I, I kind of just want to talk a little bit about about what I've. Uh, my 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 path and where I where I've been in the professional world and and uh, first of all 
I'm really pleased uh, universities today are having entrepreneurial programs. Uh, Brent and I were just talking that how great is it that he invited somebody who's not in the tech sector to, to come and visit with you. Um, there are a lot of opportunities in the tech sector for, uh, for entrepreneurs, but there's a whole world of, in the business world uh, where you can still use the same the same uh, uh, processes and the same and the same procedures and, and, and learn by the same disciplines and, and grow successful companies. Um, right out of college, I took a job out of the Bay Area for a tech company, and this was in the mid '90s, um, and uh, early to mid '90s. And back then, believe it or not, not a lot of companies, not a lot of small businesses were uh, were um, uh, digital at that time. Uh, they were still using a uh, paper and pencil. They were still using the old credit card machines that went chink chink. You're, you guys probably don't even remember those. You're you're too young for that. Uh, uh, they were still using their general ledgers were still a book. They had adding machines and they did all their inventory control by hand. Um, and there was a company out of the Bay Area and they brought all the back end areas of a business together with the front end point sale system so we could manage. And then I, they hired me in, in my area that I covered was Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. And it was my responsibility to teach small businesses how to how to um, uh, integrate technology into their business uh, to, uh, to become more successful, to get a better margin and a better um, uh, revenue. Um, so we, we taught them all, all about pricing control, um, pricing strategies, inventory control, uh, accounting, everything everything that you can think of that you guys are learning in, in school today. It was my responsibility to teach small business people how to do that. And uh, fortunately, uh, the first year, even though I had the largest territory in the entire company with the smallest population, I was a, I was a top 10 salesperson and I was their, their rookie of the year my first year. Um, and uh, I won many awards with them. You know, I was put in their, in their Hall of Fame. Um, and it was just basically hard work. So, that hard work, and I'll talk about this in a little bit too, it led to a little bit of burnout because that can happen as well. And uh, I was driving home and has anybody ever been to Montana here? There's a reason they call that the big sky state, right? That place is huge. I was eight miles from Canada in the Northwest and eight miles from Idaho, a little town called Libby. And my wife and children were living in a in a, the largest town in, in Montana and named Billings. And on a good day, that's an eight-hour drive, and this was Christmas Eve, and my wife had a Christmas party planned for seven o'clock at night uh, that Christmas Eve. I finished my last appointment at one o'clock in the afternoon in Libby, and uh, my wife, uh, these were days prior to cell phones, too. This was uh, 1995 or 96, and, and I think Utah probably had cell phones in Montana. That was, that was way in the future for Montana, um, but I made it home. An eight hour drive in the summertime, in the middle of winter, I made it home by 6.30. And so if you do the math, that's five and a half hours on IC roads. And I got home, we had a great party. Kids got up early the next morning, Santa Claus came. But I told my wife, I said, if I ever do that again, I probably won't survive. And uh, that's not the life I want, it's not the life we want. And then I've been thinking about an opportunity for myself. I've been using the last two years to, uh, to train others how to run a successful business. And so I invested in myself. I uh, put together a business plan, identified um, uh, an idea that I thought would, would be successful. And what that idea was is in Cody, Wyoming, which is at the east entrance of Yellowstone Park. Um, I had a million visitors every year go through the east entrance, which meant the only way they could get to that east entrance is through Cody, Wyoming. And uh, they did not have an RV dealership. And so uh, I thought, hey, I think an RV dealership uh, would go really well and using some of the business disciplines that, that I've been, that I've been um, teaching. So I had an idea, came up with a strategy, and I reviewed that strategy for several months and found holes in it and reviewed it again and 
and got together with a business plan that I thought was a rock solid. And fortunately, I was able to open up that dealership six months later uh, in June of 1996, I believe it was. And, uh, and what's, what's really fun about that, when you, when you have an idea and you believe in yourself and you review it, you have your strategy and you find your hold. And, and as I was doing that, I, I learned really how to be uber organized. I was organized when I was in school. Um, uh, not not to brag too much, but I but I, I graduated with high honors and I mean an A plus GPA, and because I, I learned it was just all about making sure you're doing everything you're supposed to do, and uh, and giving it back. And so I was I did that. And I opened the doors, and one of the very first weeks I was in business, I had somebody walk up to me right to my face and say, "Why are you wasting your time and money doing this?" You're never going to succeed. You're, you're going to be closed within six months. And, uh, and I forgot to mention, I did fail to mention, but I do not mention that, uh, that Cody, Wyoming, although it's it's at the east entrance of Yellowstone Park and you have a great number of RVers going through, it's about 100 miles south of Billings, Montana, which is the regional uh, uh, market uh, for, for that area. And so most of the local population would go to, to Billings to buy cars and buy RVs and buy washers, buy dryers, go to Costco and do it, do it, people do it when they were growing up there. And this gentleman told me that you, you're going to go out of business, everybody's going to go to Billings and purchase because that's what they're trying to do. And uh, and uh, I told him, you know, I, I respect that, but I don't believe it. I believe that with the, the people in this little area called the Big One Basin, it's about 50,000 people. I said, I think 50,000 people can support its own army dealership. And, uh, and so we had a, a parting of the ways. We agreed to disagree. A little bit later, another gentleman came in and said to me, this little part I picked up on your shelf is five cents more expensive than the same part was at one of the big RV dealerships, I think it was a camp before. And so I, I mentioned to him, I said, you know, if you want to spend your full day driving the buildings and paying, at that time, it was probably $20 in gas to go get that one part to save yourself a nickel, you, you can do that and you're welcome to do so. Well, um, the idea I had, the strategy that we followed, the holes that we found that we plugged, and then the drive, do not let anybody tell me I couldn't do anything or I couldn't do something. Uh, it resulted in having an award-winning RV dealership in Cody, Wyoming. And within four years, we were the second largest RV dealership in the state of Wyoming. The only one larger was the Casper, which had uh, about 10 times the population that we had. So, um, um, so you know, it, it kind of makes you feel good when you succeed. Kind of makes you feel good when somebody tells you, you can't do something and, and you can do it and you know you can do it and you believe in yourself uh, and you persevere. Um, it was kind of fun when, when I stepped back to memory with my wife. Uh, she met a, a friend of mine who was he was actually a Weber State graduate and I, and I forgot about that until right now. But he he was a he was kind of a mentor and the first time he met my wife Laura he said if I had one word that I could uh, describe Dennis to you with would be perseverance. He perseveres, and uh, and uh, so that's a kind of kind of one of the uh, lasting legacies, I guess. What I do. Um, so if you, if you as you're finding opportunities and you come up with a strategy, understand you can't do it all yourself. You've got to surround yourself with great people with talented people. I was very fortunate uh, right off the bat in 2017 when we, when we began, or when we founded Airstream of Utah, um, we connected with, with Not America. And I was looking at a lending institution at the time, uh, not so much for the lending side of it, but somebody who'd be a, a partner on some of the other aspects of the business. And we, uh, one of the things we really, really liked about Mountain America is they had a personal banker that they dedicated to our business. And uh, Steve came in all the time and, 
And uh, he was fantastic. We built a trust there and a relationship there. And pretty, pretty soon, fast forward a couple of years, and Steve introduced me to him, to a loan officer named Jared. And I was, by that time, I was looking when we opened up the dealership in, in Salt Lake. I was leasing a property. And because I didn't have the, the capital to, to purchase property in, in, on the last edge front. And, but by the time I was about three or four years into the company, we did have the capital to do so. And so, uh, so our personal banker in North America introduced us to an incredible loan officer who worked with SBA. And, and between, the, between them and us, we were able to purchase uh, a five acre park property right in the middle of Salt Lake City. And uh, we moved our dealership over there about two years ago, two and a half years ago. And, uh, and it's all because we surrounded ourselves with a good partner. Uh, going back to surrounding with a good partner. Um, again, if, if I may, uh, hopefully not boast, but if I, if I may uh, describe myself a little bit is, is I really enjoy business development and strategy. Strategy is what I really get excited about. And the nuts and bolts of a business guy, even though I can explain them and, and talk to people about them, I have no interest in actually dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Where my wife, she is a business major and an accounting major, and she does it all. As a matter of fact, I have to pull her off the computer at midnight almost every night because she said that's just her happy place. She just sits there and messes with those numbers all the time. And uh, What's fantastic is she and I meet daily. We were avid hikers. We're both outdoors people. I'm from uh, Jackson, Wyoming, as I mentioned, and, and she's from Western Montana, a um, little town called Hamilton, in the Bitterroot Mountain area. And so we're both avid outdoors people. And every morning, come rain or shine, this morning we were out with all of our rain guard, and uh, we were doing our uh, 10 mile hike this morning. And we hike and we talk. And it's an opportunity for her to tell me what she's seeing and an opportunity for me to, to give back some of the uh, the ideas I have on where we can be going with the data that, that she's given to me. So, uh, so or, uh, surround yourself with great people. Uh, currently, I'm not in the day-to-day -day operations of, of my dealership. I've got a, a son who, who has his business degree, and he's incredible as well. And he knows so much more than his dad and ever know. And, uh, and he does a fantastic job. He's uh, 28 years old now, I think, 29 years old. And I've, and he's proven himself over the six, last six years that I've, I've trusted him with my entire, my entire Salt Lake operation. And he's doing a fantastic job. Um, so surround yourself with, with talented people. I have two other sons. One's fantastic in the, in the service side of our business. And he, he manages that. That was where his 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 uh, interests lie. He, uh, he you know the traditional education wasn't his thing, so he went to tech school. And so he likes the hands-on stuff. And and for what he's doing right now in the business is fantastic. And I have another son who who's incredibly intelligent as well. Uh, I sound like a crap dad, don't I? So. Uh, <laughs> Who, who I'll talk about in a second. So, um, so it, as as you identify the right people to surround yourself, again, go back and review. Go back and review those ideas, review those strategies, and be smart enough to know that you don't know everything, and be smart enough to understand that you don't know what you don't know, and and accept some of the ideas that, that others come and, and bring to it. So, identify the areas uh, that you can improve. In, in your company, in your organization. Um, I tell my board all the time that, uh, that our organizations, now we have several, but our organizations are like children and they treat them like children. They are their own entity, their own, their own tax identity. And so that's a child that you're raising and growing. They want it to succeed. So you have to give it what it needs to succeed. Um, so, uh, so continue to learn and to grow. Um, after uh, after we established Airstream of Utah and, and we won the awards that Isabella mentioned um, that we'd won, 
Airstream approached us and say, hey, are you ready to expand? We proved, we, we proved ourselves uh, to, to the company. And uh, which is fantastic because at the time, Airstream, when they brought us on board, they had 65 dealerships nationwide, worldwide actually, only 65. It's a very exclusive brand. I guess I should have started with this, but does anybody know what an Airstream is? An Airstream trial trailer or more home? Yeah. Does anybody do not know? And I'll explain it real quick. Uh, have you ever seen a travel trailer, those silver aluminum ones that uh, look like a Twinkie? Right. That's an Airstream. <laughs> so, and, and Airstream is the, um, uh, it's the, uh, it's the number one luxury brand in, in the RV world. And, uh, they've been around since 1931, and 80% of every Airstream ever built is still on the road today. That is incredible. If anybody's ever been in an RV, one of those boxes, a JPO or a Keystone or something like that, they, they last for about five, six years. And they're string 80% of them since 1931. So 90, 90 and 88 years. Or I, math is getting to me right now. <laughs> so for a long time, they has been on the road. They stay on the road. And they're recognized um, for their quality and their craftsmanship. As a matter of fact, I, because I sold regular square ones in Wyoming, the same thing that you see at Sierra or Camping World or, or General, I sold those at my Wyoming dealership. They, that dealership I sold in, in 2000, and they're still selling those. With one of those trailers, it takes eight hours to build one trailer. So when you see a Keystone or a Jayco or something come up and up the lot, and you know it took one, one day for that to, 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 to build. And Airstream, the front door, that you walk through, it takes two days just to build the front door, and the trailer itself takes 28 days. So they're very expensive, but they last forever, and they, they have the highest quality. Um, so continue to learn and to grow and, and to delegate um, uh, responsibilities within your organization. Uh, that will help you. One of the things I learned in my first RV uh, leadership, the one in Cody, I, I just mentioned I sold it, only four, sorry, only four years after uh, after we opened, because I was doing everything, and I burned myself out. And uh, so I sold it. I took a couple of years off, and, uh, and then I was recruited to come down to Utah and and, and help a, a tech company start up. Um, and so, uh, so delegate, find great people, and delegate responsibilities to them, and trust them. You know, meet with them, have them return a report meet with them and learn. Um, and then as you do, continue to strategize to improve your business, no matter what that business is. We, our strategy was to, um, once Airstream approached us about expansion, I uh, kind of looked around and thought, okay, where would I expand? Where could I, where could I uh, reach? Knowing that it'd be difficult to, uh, to expand in Omaha, Nebraska, or or uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. So I chose uh, the Jackson Hole, Wyoming area. And so now I, I own the franchise rights for all of Utah and all of Wyoming with, with their street. And uh, so what we did about Wyoming, again, as I kind of half-heartedly mentioned earlier, there's really not a lot of population up there. But I took a really close look at our sales figures here in Utah and I realized that a fifth of all of our sales in, in Salt Lake City came from either Jackson Hole, Wyoming, Pocatello, Idaho, or Idaho Falls, Idaho. So that's a pretty good number. You don't sell a lot of Airstreams a month like you, like you do cars or like you do uh, the less expensive trailers because they, because they are uh, uh, high, you know, uh, a high income uh, unit. Uh, there's numbers that you can really work with. And I saw that we were selling about a fifth of those uh, to, to that area up there. So strategically, I chose a place where I could afford where we didn't, wouldn't have a whole lot of overhead. And I chose just outside of Alpine, Wyoming, if anybody knows where Alpine is, because Alpine, Wyoming is right on the doorstep of what? Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And it's only uh, 23 miles away, actually, from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. My dealership is about 30 miles away from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And it's also only about an hour and 20 minute drive 
from Idaho Falls and from Pocatello. So I have some uh, I have some population that's closer. And uh, so I went to those customers that were living there and I'd say, hey, if I had it. So you got to do a little research too. It's just not an idea. It's part of that is, is understanding what the customer wants. So I went to those customers and I asked them, if, you, uh, if, if we had a dealership there, would this be something that you think would be successful that you would use that those you know who are in, a, in the same market for a trailer that you are, would, would come and visit in Wyoming rather than Salt Lake City. And 100%, we did not have one person say, no, I'd rather drive to Salt Lake City than we can drive to Star Valley in Wyoming. And so uh, we decided to go forward and I, and I did the projections of what we needed uh, for sales and service there to, to uh, be successful. And, um, and we, we took the leap with Mountain America. They, they saw the projections I had, they saw the numbers and, and the different uh, criteria that they asked for, and they believed in it as well. So we opened that dealership up July 5th, the day after July 4th last year, 2022. And uh, and we have nearly doubled the projections that I had going into it. So we've been very, very fortunate. And the challenge to my Wyoming team, or my Utah team was, okay, I'm taking a fifth of your customers away. You're not going to lose any of the revenue you had because I'm pulling away a 50 in the revenue source right now. And they haven't, they've held steady for me. So which really means they grow by 20%. So I'm very, very happy with that. Very happy with that. They've done a great job for us. So continue to strategize, continue to look at your vision that you have and and, and see that vision and, and then understand, hey, how can I improve? How can I grow? How can I improve? It wouldn't have made sense for, for me to, to expand into to another realm that had nothing to do with my area of expertise in the RV world. Does that make sense? I kind of stayed there. Another thing that I found that did go with RVs is as I've gone through all the seminars I've gone to and learned what I've learned, uh, there are 1.1 million campsites in the United States right now, uh, private and, uh, and uh, public. There are 11.1 RVs on the road right now that are registered at uh, different DMVs. Um, so there's a shortfall of 10 million RV campsites. So when I went and found an area in Wyoming, which is in the Yellow, greater Yellowstone region, outside of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, in the middle of beautiful mountains, a beautiful spot, uh, I bought a property rather than five acres an RV dealership on that. I bought 50 acres knowing that 40 of those acres I was going to turn into a luxury RV resort. And so people who are coming through, come to Jackson, they'll stop, they'll, um, they'll you know, uh, spend some time with us there. Uh, what's fantastic about that is, is we're taking uh, reservations for, for next year right now. And for the lots I have available, I'm not all the way built out. But for the lots I have available, we're about 85% full right now. So people are really, really responding to that. And one of the things I looked at, the strategy that we did, again, I keep going back to strategy. If, if you guys have ever gone to a KOA or, or a different campground or a camping RV park, you notice that you're, you're in there almost as close as you guys are sitting right now. You notice that the RVs are just right on top of each other. I decided to make this very low density. Uh, I'm a Wyoming kid. When I went camping, I never saw another person. Uh, to me, camping is not having somebody who's trailer parked right here so I can hear the generator running all night. Uh, so we went 40 acres long, putting 150 sites in, into that. Uh, they're very spread out. I just spent nearly a million dollars on trees. So every site's very, very private. And um, and people are responding to it. It's been fantastic. And because it's a, that's where I see the luxury at, we're, uh, we're uh, charging the luxury price. And that's getting us to the market that we want to have. We want to have those there that are in their airstreams or, or those big half million dollar motor coaches that you guys see driving down the road. And that's who's coming to us. And uh, there's a reason why we don't do that. Um, one of the things I learned 
as I burned out being the number one sales, one of the number one salespeople for a tech company on a, on a Bay Area, and a huge area that I, I drove 70,000 miles one year and I, I flew another 60,000 miles that year. And another uh, thing I learned when I burned out when I first started the industry uh, that I sold four years after I, I founded it was that you have to invest in yourself. You have to uh, take care of yourself. And, uh, and I've learned to do that now. Uh, my wife and I, as I mentioned, we are, we are absolutely avid outdoors and people. And we've hiked, we've done the, what's called the Outlook in Switzerland. We took time off. Uh, about three years ago and spent a month hiking from Mont Blanc, France to the Matterhorn in, in Switzerland, up and over eight of the highest peaks that they have. Um, we, we try to go skiing all over North America in the winter time. We uh, just got back from a two week thing where we explored the uh, Adriatic in the Ionian Seas in Greece and, and in Italy and all those little countries out there. But the reason I say that, not to brag about where we've been is because it lets you get away and decompress and then recharge those batteries. You know, you've got to do that. You've got to get away, invest in yourself and and uh and recharge yourself. And sometimes investing in, in myself is finding a great book on business it's, and uh and having that on the phone and listening to it as I'm driving rather than listening to sports or music or something like that. It's given me an opportunity to get away from what I'm doing to think about other things. And every time you invest in yourself, that's the most valuable thing that you can do for yourself. So, and uh, so with that, and finally, I would like to, uh, to invite you. One of the things I, I learned is to be flexible. Um, I had a presentation for you. And it's been a good one, hasn't it? <laughs> it's a snowstorm in Wyoming. That's what that is. Um, I got caught up in a couple little things this morning, and uh, I had to put them out. And I had my I had my computer at my desk, ready for me to grab and, and head out the door. And uh, about a hundred miles away from from I work out of my house now, hundred miles away from my home office. I realized I forgot my computer. My PowerPoints on my computer. So uh, so I'm sitting, I'm here today with the same talking points, but, but without any visuals for you guys to look at. So I apologize myself for that to you guys that you've had to look at me instead of that. But what you would have seen is just airstream trailers and pictures of my of my businesses, which probably wouldn't have been that interesting to you anyway. But um, but so be flexible. Understand it's never going to go exactly like you have to. And you've got to be able to, uh, you've got to be able to uh, duck and bow and bow or whatever the boxing terms are. And uh, I'll give you another little story. The tech company that I was working at, in between my RV stands, I was responsible for uh, integrating their technology in every computer that, that's out there today. And within my last three years on the company, with the company, it took a while, but the last three years I was successful. We did that. And that's why in 2016, they were buying out the contract and I was going to go buy an airstream and retire and not. And, um, and then this life came on. So I was flexible with, with my life uh, decisions as well. But as I was, uh, as I was doing my, my work, with this tech company, I was also trying to, to get our government to support it and help me out by talking to other governments with tariffs and all that good stuff to get it into, into China and get it into Taiwan, get it into Japan, get it into Germany, uh, get it into Italy, Ireland, England, all these places that I was working. And so I was I had a I had a sit-down meeting with the sitting US Senator from Utah. I guess we're probably too young with you guys remember uh, Senator Bennett? And so I, I went to sit down with Senator Bennett. I had a full suit on because that's what you do when you when you go and you visit with a, a member um, of the legislature. And as I sat down, my crotch ripped out my pants. <laughs> and it just opened up the whole world. And there I was sitting in front of the senator. <laughs> so being flexible, I put my legs together and crossed my legs. <laughs> 
and uh, went on with my discussion. I don't think he even knew I had a problem. I was the proverbial duck who was very calm on the surface, but my legs were paddling 100 miles an hour under the water. And, uh, and it was a lot of it was mental, but I had to be flexible. Another time I was sitting down in Tokyo with, um, with the highest marketing people of Pioneer. And uh, just as I sat down and started my presentation, and it was very formal in Japan, the, the uh, presentations are extremely formal. Um, as I was sitting down talking to him, I reached out for something. And rather than having a water bottle, I had a glass of water on the table and I hid it and water went all over all of their papers. It didn't hurt mine, but every one of my Japanese colleagues, everything, and they're picking up their computers as fast as they did. And uh, unfortunately in, in international business, we are so fortunate. I speak Spanish, but that, that really doesn't really matter. Um, international business, English is the business language. We are so fortunate that it's so it is as fluent in English as you possibly can, because it's really helpful. Um, but anyway, so I apologized to him and I felt really bad, you know, all the vows and, and everything that you do in Japan. And one of the uh, one of the guys finally said, um, Dennis or whatever he called me, don't worry about it. This just made you human. That was fantastic. And he understood that we had to be flexible at that moment. And that uh, went from there. And I can give you guys all kinds of, uh, of uh, examples where we have to be flexible. But do that. Go back and revisit your ideas, revisit your strategies, be flexible where you need to, accept all the information you can, all the data points from everybody that you can, and then, and then believe in yourself, invest in yourself, and go forward with yourself. We have some time for Q&A. Do you have any questions? Tips for selling something so expensive. How do you find these people? Oh, fantastic. You, uh, uh, we went into this back when I did my first RV dealership. You know, they were their irregular $10,000, $20,000 trailers. But my, my, my market was very localized in, in Northwest Wyoming, as well as the trade going into, into uh, Yellowstone. And this was, you got to remember, this was 96 to 2000. So most of my marketing was radio, newspaper, that kind of stuff. When we went into this dealership in Salt Lake in 2017, 2016, 2017, uh, we made the strategic uh, thought of doing nothing that wasn't digital. Every bit of my uh, marketing now is digital. Uh, so with that, we're just marketing to the right income levels, you know, all the demographics that you need. You know, if somebody likes a Harley motorcycle, they're in a certain demographic group. And I can find that and I market to that same person. Somebody buys a Tesla, I market to that same person. If somebody looks up Airstream somewhere along the line, all of a sudden, in, in my little fenced area, they're going to see Airstream in Utah. They go where they go. And I don't know exactly all of that stuff, but I do know what I want. And I've got great people who make it happen for me. So, uh, so you know, then they come and they report to me every month. Okay, this is how many hits we had. This is how much we go on the file. And when I sell to them, when they get on the block, what I've trained my sales team is that don't be afraid of price. Um, you just can't be afraid of price. And uh, what you're selling, you're selling value. And I don't care if you're buying a couch or a TV, or what it is. There comes a point in life when you quit purchasing because of price, we start purchasing because of value and long-term value. And that's what we're selling to people. Value. They're, they're looking for something. And it's a lifestyle. Again, I brought up Harley. Those people who are in the Airstreams leave their lock, stock, and barrel in the Airstreams. Just this year in Rock Springs, Wyoming, of all places, I'm a Wyoming boy. I still believe Rock, Rock Springs is one of the ugliest places on earth. <laughs> but, uh, I hope I didn't offend anybody here. <laughs> but in Rock Springs, they had their international Airstream rally this year. 2,000 Airstreamers came from everywhere to Rock Springs, Wyoming, because the fairgrounds in Rock Springs was big enough to hold that many people. 
and they're going back in four years, which is to me is crazy. But they are so into it, they love to get together, they have their clubs, and uh, so you get somebody who's on the precipitous of getting in there, and you just have to sell them on the lifestyle value that they're getting. My my dad is my, I know we got a question here, but my dad, he he's an old, he's in his 80s, and he was born in the beginning of World War II. His parents just went through the depression. He went through World War II. And so he was kind of one of those penny save, penny burns, you don't throw anything away kind of guy. When when he finally had to move from his house to a small home, he uh, wouldn't believe all the stuff he was saving through the first because he just didn't throw anything away because he could use it someday. And he got on me when I told him I was opening up the search for leadership and said, why would somebody buy a $100,000 trailer when they can go buy a $20,000 trailer down the road? And I said, well, think about this now. When I was a kid, you took me camping all the time, didn't you? He said, yeah. And I said, you bought a trailer, right? And I said, yeah. And I said, you still have that trailer? He said, no. And I said, you probably had 15, 20 trailers in my 50 or some years of going camping with you. He said, he thought, he said, yeah, I have. I said, I guarantee you I've spent $100,000 on all those trailers. Or if you had an Airstream where 80% of them were still on the road from 1931, you could have still had that same trailer and you'd be money in today. So, you know, when you get through it, you know, you, when you're teaching value and stuff like that, there's a whole thing. It's more of an elevated pitch for that. Come by the dealership. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you have a question? Yeah, you kind of answered my question. I was just wondering, um, it seems like you opened the first dealership up before like the big technology, smartphones, digital boom. So I was wondering what type of marketing you used before. Oh, 100% digital. And now Airstream is growing up a little bit. Corporation, um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, go to your point. The top dealers within Airstream, they follow the same strategy. I do. I that strategy. They follow the same strategy. Every one of them are digital only. And, uh, and some of the smaller ones, they're still doing the 6.30 a.m. TV commercials. Come on down. You know, and that's just is it the right demographic. You need to really target with, with a digital target. You can fine tune that right down to who you want to get your message. Kind of goes along with uh, your answer to the first question, but. With such a high percentage of airstreams like still being on the road, I was just curious on how that kind of like affects your uh, client like how much repeat business you get versus like how many times people are coming in and buying for the first one. Fantastic, it's a great story. Uh, an interesting, uh, another inter interesting statistic about, about airstreams is 74 and a half percent of all airstream purchasers, buyers, are first time RVers. That's the very first RV they've ever purchased in their entire life. So, what does that tell you? They're old like me. <laughs> They've saved up some money in their life. They're deciding that they're what they want. They're going to buy for value. They're not going to buy for, for price. And and they grew up also learning all their life that hey, these airstreams are the top quality. You know, they they're they're the online rather than the Mercedes Benz or whatever you want to call it in, in the RV world. So um, to answer your question, a good dealership. No matter if it's RV or car or whatever, boat dealership, any of those dealerships you guys are driving by every day, the service department should be paying for, you, for the dealership. And uh, with 80% of the airstreams on the road still, uh, our service department has no has no problem doing that for us. We, uh, we have, I think we just hired our 10th technician here in, in Salt Lake, and we're still five weeks out. On service before we get somebody in the door. So uh, they come in, they're, uh, I'll go back and I'll say it again, airstreams are the best RV you can buy, but they're still made by hand. Any any trailer, see all the things you learn when, when you're in this kind of business, any trailer behind a car is experiencing a 6.8 magnitude earthquake back there. And so think about your house. Does your house need repaired if it goes through an earthquake? A constant earthquake for hours on end? Yeah. So airstreams are no different. No trailers are no different. They go through blah, 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 blah. and little things get loose, little things get fixed. And so we fix it. Now, the great thing about airstream while they're still on the road is I mentioned the 
somebody that it was a it looked like a Twinkie. And that's how they started with a with a guy named Wally Bond. And years and years ago, he worked in a in an airplane manufacturing facility. And so he took that idea from airplane fuselages, you know how they're all circle. There's a reason that they're circles, because that circle can hold the pressures better than squares. And so he said, hey, I can do that with the trailer. And so he started doing that with the trailer. And so Airstreams, it's a single skeleton around it with the aluminum sheeting. And as it's going down the road, it's doing this. So you get the, you get the square ones, you're doing this. And that's why they start leaking. That's why they only last for a certain amount of years where this will last forever. So anyway, yeah, so the service size takes care of things. Um, we get a lot of repeat customers. We had somebody bought a trailer just this week, uh, a trailer, um, and they purchased a new one from me from this dealership probably four months ago. There's, a, there's kind of a joke within all our stream dealers is that two years, two feet means every two years somebody's going to come back and go like two feet bigger. <laughs> so they, they've been out in it, they say, hey, this is great, but you know, it's a cool. Um, so I've really enjoyed uh, your talk tonight. Thank you. And um, I think a big part of it is I'm also a salesperson. Uh -huh. and so I'm curious, had you not had the sales experience you had prior to going on your own, would your story be different, do you think? You know, that's a great question. I really appreciate that. So uh, I can't remember if it was Jade or Brandon I was talking to earlier about it. About that, I think it was Jupiter's brand about how fortunate you guys are for being in an entrepreneurial um, setting here in school and how it's going to give you a leg up on, on what I had experienced in my life. But as I as we talked about that, I got to think of my dad was a contractor and he had his own construction company. And there was a little construction company up in Jackson, Wyoming, and, and he eventually moved it up to, to Billings, Montana. He got tired of all the people moving up to Jackson, which is kind of counterintuitive for a contractor, right? <laughs> but he, he was a Wyoming guy too. So, uh, so anyway, so uh, uh, but he had his own company, and I kind of grew up seeing him having to go out and win bids to get work, and then do this and do that, to do that, get, 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 uh, to get work. And when I was going through college. Um, my parents, they're, they're very old school. They said, you know, you're 18, you're out of the house, you're on your own type of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I hustled in, in college. I would buy a car. So I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't working for a car sales dealership. But I'd buy a, a car I thought was a, a big deal. And I'd go detail it myself and turn around a few weeks later and sell it for 500 bucks. That's how I made money. So I started selling on my own. So I had that kind of that instinct. And I'm, you know, I'm still thinking about just surviving. Mentioned your third son earlier. Oh, <laughs> I'll get back to him. You know, and he's my oldest. I can't forget him. <laughs> Surrounding myself with good people now. This son, what, what's fantastic about him, he, um, business is not his forte like my other two sons. But, uh, but when I, when we had the opportunity in Wyoming, he had a great desire. He, he, he grew up in, in Cody, Wyoming, a town of five or 10,000 people, not very many people. So when we plunked him in the heart of, of the Wasatch, it was, it was really overwhelming. I mean, he was going to college and all that stuff. He came to work for me at the dealership. And when I started talking about this opportunity, he said, Dad, I will do whatever I have to do to, to get back to a small town and, and work in that dealership. He said, if you want me to detail trailers, I'll do it. And he'd been working for me in the parts department over here. And I said, I'll tell you what, you've been with me for four years now, five years now. I'm going to make you the general manager up there, but I want you to be mentored by your younger brother, who's the general manager of this one. He was humble enough to do it and did it. And he's doing a fantastic job up there. I took my hat to him. He, he has grown and I, Living up there, I pop in a lot. I, I want to make sure we're going to do what we're going to do. Now, with that being said, I was extremely fortunate that he's assistant manager up there and, and our uh, service manager up there. He came to me about a, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, about a year and a half ago. He had just retired as the uh, service manager at Hill Air Force Base. 
He was over all the service of all the airplanes and kill. And all the parts people had to go through him. The guy's uber organized, incredible man. And so I, I hired him on the spot. And he's been fantastic. And he's helped match my son, helped extremely organized as well. And so together they did a good job. As a matter of fact, they both named Josh. And they both have long beards. And uh, if I could grow a mustache, I'd be the third one for seat to pop up there. But I can't grow a mustache. So. <laughs> yeah. How did you go about finding the right partners for your partners for your business, especially during early on? Now, back in the old day, back in my first dealership, we didn't have the internet back then. We were not back in 1995 and 96 when I was putting the first dealership together. Uh, uh, the internet was it was really non-existent. I think AOL, if you anybody remembers AOL, was just starting, but um, that's kind of like a People magazine. It's all that was. Um, so it was one of those things you just, you go down the library, you look at resource books, you start making phone calls, uh, you start making phone calls. I can remember, uh, I can remember finally after just digging, figuring out how I was going to put this RV dealership together, uh, I got a hold of somebody at Fleetwood Manufacturing. And back in that day, Fleetwood was the number one manufacturer. They had brands like Terry and Oh, Mallard, I think you guys might have seen Terry's and Mallard's and Prowler's. They had these simple brands like that. Got a hold of their one of their reps, and he just agreed to take me on. He took me on because I had to send him credit out. And so he ran my, my social. And that's another thing. The last thing and best bit of advice I ever got from my one of my girlfriend's dad. She and I are no longer together, obviously, but but her dad told me. Get the best credit you can get and keep it spotless because it's a two edged sword. And it's absolutely the truth. And I had squeaky clean, wonderful credit then. My proud to say my credit rating is still well above 800 right now. So, uh, um, so he looked at my credit and said, Okay, we're going to take a chance on you. And he said, Now you need to find a flooring company. Uh, so, you know, I couldn't afford all these traders. I still can't afford all these traders. They learn a lot. And so, uh, I, so I went back to him and I just asked the question, hey, who are some of the flooring companies? Who are some of the companies that will pay for these traders to get them on my lot so I can sell them, pay them out, and I keep that margin, uh, okay. that difference. And so he gave me a list and uh, back, back in the day, there was a company called Bombardier. Same thing, they, I gave him the credit, how they took a chance on us. Um, and, and we went from there. Bombardier, does anybody know who Bombardier is now? Skidoo's and Sea Jets and all those guys, that's Bombardier. They make airplanes and do all kinds of stuff. Um, but back in the day, they had a finance company that they sold off to GE, who sold off somebody else. And when I came back and started again, before I even met Mountain America, Mountain America came in after we were established. I had to go through all the same processes. This time I had the internet, so it was a lot easier. But so the first thing I did is I went, I'd already gotten Airstream money. Online. The reason I found the Airstream guys is because being in the RV world traditionally or historically, I knew what the best one out there was. My wife, I want to retire. My wife didn't want me to. Uh, so I was going to surprise her with a new Airstream and we were going to go play. And, uh, and uh, Air, Salt Lake didn't have an Airstream dealership. So instead of going, everybody at the time was going to Boise and buying an Airstream. We're going to uh, Los Angeles and buying a Boise or buying an Airstream. I am. Uh, I wouldn't do that. That's too long to drive for me. So I called up Ohio and I said, guys, why aren't you in Utah? This is the best place in America to have an Airstream dealership. We are in the midst of six national parks that are within five hour drive. This is crazy. So serendipitously, they were they were telling me they did and that they didn't, they didn't respond right away. It took perseverance. After about three months, they finally got me to a, to a, a representative. And he, he did tell me, he said, well, we're going out to Salt Lake. I can remember it very well. It was uh, the week before Thanksgiving in 2016. We're going to be out there this week, and we're going to choose a, a dealership. And we're currently, we're looking at General and Sierra. And I think Paris was the third one. And uh, he said, if you want to meet and put a presentation together, that's fine. So, so I took him over to the Grand hotel and uh, for Grand American and, and we sat there to your room and I had a presentation and, and 
and my strategy was to be an exclusive Airstream dealership. I wasn't going to mess with any other brands. We were going to be experts in Airstream. That's all we were ever going to do. And uh, talked to him and he had a partner with him. And uh, there's two divisions in Airstream. There's travel trailer and touring coach. Both of them were there. And then they went off and had their others. Well, that night I got a phone call and said, we'd like to go with you. Even though I wasn't a current RV dealer at the time. And I came to find out, fast forward, is Airstream at the same time, they were pivoting their company from being an also brand or a brand with multiple, that is with multiple brands to exclusive dealers. And they're still in the midst of that, of that transition where everybody's focusing on, on exclusive Airstream dealerships now. And so I was, fortunately, I was one of the very first that came, they presented with that idea. They, they gave it to me. And, uh, they allowed me to have it, and uh, and we were important with that. So that's how I found them. Going back to the flooring company, I went right back to my source. I went back to Bombardier. They were no longer in business. They sold it. I went back to whoever they sold it to. They were no longer in business. You get it down the line, about five or six line or cheeks of that chain, and I found out who now owns that flooring that space. And I, I approached them, and, and they got very comfortable with as well. So. Yeah, good credit. If I didn't have good credit, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Uh, is there anything you wish you would have done differently? A lot of things. <laughs> is there any main main one? Uh, uh, main one, I would have. I wish I would have. I burned myself out the times I had. I wish I would have invested back in myself. And um, you know, I'm. Um, that's that's one of the big. Big picture of things. There's always a few mistakes we make. Uh, you know, uh, uh, customer service. I wish uh, we would have learned some customer service things that we do now earlier on. We would have saved us a lot of hard hiring good people. Um, it's extremely important. Uh, you know, sometimes you get in bind and you hire whoever you can, and sometimes it's better to wait. And uh, stay in a line with the kind of right person. Uh, so hiring good people is super important. Um, you know, we're still in today. We we're dealing with with an employee that was a good hire, but we thought we needed them. But but now we've got uh, procedures in place where we can identify that right away, and we found an excellent plan for that. So we can get this go right back to it. So. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you guys. You've been fantastic. We appreciate you coming. <laughs>